I'm going to be talking to David Doherty, who's the head of oil research at Bloomberg NEF, about oil consumption forecasts. Uh, Bloomberg NEF is very strong on the electric transportation forecasting front, and that, of course, is the big driver behind uh, eventual declines in oil demand. So welcome to the interview, David. Thank you for having me, Malcolm. Well, look, uh, every analyst that I've talked to about peak oil uh, says that the demand change will be asymmetrical. So we're going to see in North America and Europe, we're going to see a, a decline sooner, but emerging markets will uh, actually grow for a while. Petrochemical will grow for a while. And electric transportation is the key driver here, how fast it, it uh, disseminates and how many miles are driven by electric vehicles and so on, and especially heavy duty and medium duty versus light duty, all of that. So, and Bloomberg NEF's got some unique insights into that. Why don't you give us an overview of those, please? Yeah, I would agree that we're, we're broadly in line with people in terms of where we see demand growing in terms of geographics, right? Um, it's, it's difficult to argue that the US and Europe mature markets won't decline in terms of consumption. Policies help that, a green push from the companies operating there, um, and less population growth than the likes of India or China, for example. We do see it being a little bit different, I think, to other forecasters in terms of what drives growth, um, what the underlying currents are pushing in a particular way, and how fast and how high it can go. So our peak is lower than other peaks, um, but we have a sort of a peak um, decline and plateau story where we see a pretty quick drop off um, after the 2033, 2034 point where we see peak happening. Um, but there is a floor in terms of consumption um, when we see things like aviation and petrochemicals demand support that number coming back up. Like you said at the start, though, road fuels are the, um, the biggest piece of the pie at the moment in terms of consumption and the one that everybody's looking at. Um, most people are, you know, not looking at aviation or petrochemicals as the markets that are going to overtake that. Um, for, you know, comparisons, aviation is about 7 million barrels per day in a pre-COVID year. Petch chemicals about 12 and road fuels are about 45 to 50, depending on what you include in that. So, you know, magnitudes of difference. Right now, uh, I understand that you're forecasting that US and Europe are going to lose about 8 million barrels a day of demand by 2040. And India and China are going to miss out on 6 million barrels a day of, of growth opportunity. Have I got that correct? Yeah, and it's a key difference, right? It's um, it's a decline from existing levels versus a what might have been not uh, coming to fruition. And if you're an oil refiner or a producer, that's a big difference, right? A uh, very big difference in terms of where you put your dollars in terms of infrastructure and refining, pipelines, ports, fueling stations. Um, so it's a completely different story versus, you know, if this did exist or if these cars were driven with gasoline, this would happen. Um, there's a lot less risk there of a stranded asset, for example, if you're on the western side of the hemisphere here in Europe or there in North America. Um, that is something people will be watching in a very different shape and form, yeah. Um, and we've seen Europe is very aggressive with policies for the, uh, the green push, so to speak, and we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, but we're increasingly seeing that in the US and we have been seeing that in Canada as well for some time. So policies are here in those two regions and that's really what's driving it this side of uh, 2030 at least, the, the decline in consumption that is. Well, let's talk about the decline between now and 2030. H how much are you expecting oil consumption in North America to decline by then? Yeah, so both North America and um, Europe have already peaked in terms of road fuel consumption, and there's very little they can do to grow beyond that. There's, uh, you know, there's not as much population growth. Um, people are driving at a later age. We're seeing um, license numbers come down. You know, uh, it's very easy to get an Uber these days. Ten years ago, you had to get a driver's license to get that mobility yourself, right? So the way that we're consuming miles, so to speak, is completely changing. Um, we do see that it will decline between the two of them by over a million barrels per day by 2030. So that's in the next decade, which is a significant number, but it's not a sharp decline. Um, and that's kind of something to bear in mind. It gets quite sharp between 2030 and 2040, where we see that multiplied by about eight times, there's about 8 million barrels per day less by then. But before that, you're kind of, you know, moving, um, moving a lot of electric vehicles to stay put in terms of uh, global consumption of gasoline and diesel. So you need to do a lot now in order to make the 2030 to 2040 and then 2040 to 2050 periods count to get less carbon out of the system. 
Now, this is a, a particularly uh, uh, interesting conversation from Canada's point of view, because uh, it exports three and a half million barrels a day, uh, far and away, the, you know, uh, out of 5 million barrels a day produced down to the US. And it has very little export capacity outside of uh, the United States. Yep. So if the United States declines, uh, American producers have lots of export capacity out of ports, you know, like places like Texas, Canadians don't. So they're kind of held captive by the American market. That suggests that Canada might suffer disproportionately when, when consumption begins to decline. I think that's completely fair um, to, to highlight. It's, um, I mean, infrastructure isn't so forgiving for the Canadian oil system. In many ways, it's out of the Canadian ground and into a U.S. refinery through a pipeline. Um, on the plus side, U.S. refineries are built for Canadian oil and heavier types of oil. They're very complex machines, um, and Canadian oil is suitable for them. You know, we saw the shale boom happen over the last few years. U.S. refiners don't like that crude. It doesn't fit to their sort of perfect match in terms of what they'll take into their refiners. So in many ways, yes, you could say that Canada's been held, could be held captive if that demand declines. But in many ways, it's a, you know, it's a cheaper fuel. It's a cheaper crude oil. And they, they built the infrastructure to suit this crude. So in other ways, it's in a good position, right? Um, but you will see, I think, as time goes forward, different regulations come into play that will start to penalize Canadian crude. So life cycle emissions, for example, we've seen talk of this in the aviation sector, whispers about it in the European Commission for the road fuel segment. If you trace the carbon emissions of a barrel from that of a, a barrel of gasoline through the value chain and up into a, a tar sands, it looks a lot worse than if you're to the same to Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, so Canadian crude will face a choppy future, I think, um, in terms of its emissions profile in general outside of even just being so connected to the US market. Now, when we talk about electric transportation affecting oil consumption, very often we think of cars and trucks. That's right. the most common. But in fact, uh, there's a lot of innovation going on in medium duty, uh, say uh, delivery vans, garbage trucks, that sort of thing, yep. and heavy duty, which would be more like long haul trucking. And uh, I understand, you know, well, well, tell us where you see medium and heavy duty in this uh in in the playing a role in declining oil consumption yeah well the trucking market is interesting because it's not one market no you can compare a small car to an suv fairly similarly their drive cycles are the same so the way that we have to think about trucking is completely different it's the last mile delivery van think of amazon think of like a walmart delivery uh, versus a class a cross country truck right very different very different technology use cases um, if you think of the lighter sizes, quite often those vehicles are built off of similar platforms by the same people who are investing billions into electric passenger cars. So the synergies are there and we're seeing already the likes of Amazon pledging to buy fleets and fleets of electric vans from Rivian and from uh, Mercedes here in Europe, for example. So we think that that's kind of gone that direction already and momentum is behind it. The more interesting thing in terms of a um, an oil producer or a fuel producer, it's particularly relevant for the diesel market, is what happens, like you said, in medium and heavy. And they're very difficult to decarbonize. But year on year, as we do this research now, we're seeing more and more commitments towards different technologies, and we're seeing more and more technological advancements. Um, Europe and the US are in a pretty good position in terms of uh, transferring those fleets. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that um, in Europe, for example, the highway network is quite concentrated. Building out the infrastructure would be a lot less of a lift than, say, in the US. That said, it wouldn't be so difficult in the US because the vast majority of trucks operate on concentrated roads. Um, but at the same time, what you're seeing is um, the, the truck manufacturers shifting towards a um, a diesel plus model, if that makes sense. So some are looking at LNG, for example, as the alternative fuel or the cleaner fuel. Some are looking at hydrogen, but increasingly more and more are looking at electric. Um, the difficulty with electric is often quoted as it's going to be too heavy to put a battery onto this truck and still be able to carry things. In the US and Europe, the, the loads in general tend to be much lighter than, say, in India or in China, for example. You're not carrying raw materials like cement or, or much heavier things. So uh, trucks tend to volume out or cube out, as it's called, as opposed to weight out. So you don't reach your weight capacity. It's how much you can actually fit into the truck. So that benefits the systems in the US and in Europe. The interesting part is when hydrogen becomes more um, of a player in that market. In terms of costs, we think the earliest that could happen is towards the end of the 2030s. The difficulty at that stage is it's not just competing with diesel. It's competing with a, a slightly more established electric market already. 
Um, hydrogen comes with lots of uh, benefits, but it also comes with a lot of the necessity of a um, infrastructure build out. So will that happen having flipped the infrastructure towards electric heavier trucks? That's much more difficult and that will require more, um, more and more investment. So we actually think that uh, an earlier breakthrough in medium and heavy electric trucks, albeit maybe not the perfect thing, um, will delay hydrogen coming through. Uh, final question, David. And um, I, I made the argument in, in a recent essay that the 2020s are going to be the disruptive decade of this energy transition. And with disruption comes uncertainty. And we've seen Bloomberg NEF and, and other forecasters, of course, uh, change their forecast for electric vehicle uh, diffusion over the last you know, number of years because you know, automakers are committing more, there's more consumer interest, on and on and on. Adoption rates are, are rising. Have you taken that kind of uncertainty into account or is there a possibility that uh, you know, more intense disruption as this decade wears on could change your, your forecast you know, down the road? Yeah, absolutely. It could change it again. It's kind of the, the fun part of being an analyst and watching this change every year, I guess. It's also the difficult part. Um, I think changes would be likely to push it forward. So you'd see something like peak oil demand earlier rather than later. Um, where our forecasts tend to change is the longer term stuff. So in the short term, you've got a maybe a supply side capacity, but the numbers are far, far smaller and less disruptive to say the oil market than something out in 2040. Um, so there is a cap at the moment, but globally, if you're looking at the EV market, you're sprinting today to stay still almost until 2030. So all of these new EVs, all of these improvements are meeting new mobility demand. They're not disrupting globally, at least current mobility demand. Um, so it's just very fast sprint to ultimately stay at the same place by 2030 in terms of consumption. So the world has a lot to do. So if it does go earlier than that, it would be better for the environment, um, but worse for the oil sector. So it's really what we would like to, um, what perspective you have on that, I guess. Well, David, thank you very much for this. I really appreciate your insights. Thank you. Nice to speak to you.